As a leader of the Special Forces team, I am known by the call sign Phoenix. My team and I have faced countless dangerous missions, but this one, this one was different. We were dispatched to a remote Arctic research station that had gone dark during a deadly snowstorm. As we arrived at the desolate research station, the biting cold seeped into our bones and the deafening silence of the Arctic wilderness surrounded us. The heavy snowfall had blanketed the area, making it difficult to discern anything beyond a few feet. With our senses heightened and weapons at the ready, we cautiously entered the station. Inside, we found a scene of unimaginable horror. The bodies of at least 50 scientists were frozen, some even partially eaten. The brutality of what had occurred sent chills down our spines. Undeterred by the grisly sight, we knew we had to uncover the truth behind this tragedy. As we inspected around the base, the mist outside the windows obscured our vision. But then, through the haze, we caught a glimpse of something both terrifying and enigmatic. The creature, unlike anything we had ever encountered before, stood just beyond the research station. Its face was completely covered in white fur, with only a hint of a mouth barely visible from the distance of our cameras, which were surprisingly close, despite the treacherous conditions. The creature's entire body seemed to be shrouded in fur, resembling the backside of a snow bear at first glance. But as it turned, the profile of its head revealed a distinct dome, shaped cranium and a sloping forehead, reminiscent of both gorillas and the legendary Bigfoot creatures of lore. Our hearts raced as the creature disappeared into the howling arctic storms. Its screech pierced the air, so high-pitched that we instinctively covered our ears to protect ourselves from its eerie call. Determined to unravel the mystery behind this elusive being, we set out to find and eliminate the creature. But as we combed the treacherous terrain, it became evident that this was no ordinary adversary. It moved with an agility and stealth that defied logic, evading our pursuit at every turn. Each time we thought we had it cornered, it would vanish into the unforgiving Arctic landscape, leaving us with nothing but unanswered questions and a growing sense of dread. As the relentless Arctic storms raged around us, we knew our time was running out. The creature, with its mysterious origins and uncanny abilities, remained one step ahead, eluding our every attempt to capture or neutralize it. With heavy hearts and a profound sense of awe, we finally made the difficult decision to abort the mission and retreat. The Arctic wilderness had revealed a secret beyond comprehension, and we were left to grapple with the knowledge that there were forces in this world that defied explanation. Now, my dad was in the Army. He just retired last October, so we moved around a lot. Went from Washington State to Texas to Anchorage, Alaska, and it was there that my fear resurfaced and haunted me. We lived in a two-story house with a basement and an attic on Fort Richardson, just between Anchorage and a little town called Eagle River. The entrance to the attic was in the ceiling of the hallway, right at the top of the stairs. I'd never been up there, and in the two years we lived in that house, I never did. So it was a total mystery what was up there. I don't even think we stored anything up there. We put it all in the basement or the garage. Anyway, I always had this strange thought that, like the Goosebumps episode, there was a sarcophagus with a mummy up there just waiting to come out and attack us. This was always just a strange fantasy to me until one day... I was passing under the entrance to go to our computer room, back when those were a thing. When I looked up, the square door was completely sealed, but stuck in one side, poking out into the hall, was something brown, almost like a stained white something. It looked astonishingly like a bandage, like a centuries-old, dirty, grimy, blood-stained bandage, exactly like a nightmarish mummy might be wrapped in. We moved out that Christmas into a newer, bigger house across base. My dad was high rank, and we'd originally just been eager to have a house. 
I tried not to think about the bandage or what it might actually be, and avoided looking up in the hallway. I never found out, and I never asked if anyone else had seen it. Of course, it certainly couldn't have been a bandage, especially not a mummy bandage. What would an ancient Egyptian mummy be doing stowed away in an attic in Alaska? But I was like ten years old and didn't know any better. Always scared the crap out of me staying up at night, wondering if he was up there sleeping, waiting, biding his time. I live in the suburbs of Southern California, San Diego County area. On several occasions when letting my dog out, I would see odd silent flying craft with spotlights shining scanning around. My dog would growl and rub back inside. He would not leave my side for the rest of the night. In other nights, when my insomnia new kicks in, I don't fall asleep till about 4 a.m. During the summer nights, I leave my window open to cool down since I don't have air conditioning. Around 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, I hear a screeching sound that sounds like no animal I know that lives around me. I heard a pack of coyotes make a kill when the feast, the whole pack yelp and howls. They killed around three and the screeching started. The sound traveled so fast to the coyotes and then suddenly the sounds turned extremely violent. Heard at least four coyotes yelping in pain only to be silenced moments later. Seeing and hearing this shit makes me want to be home or a place where I am sleeping at by 2.30. If I am out later for any reason, I start watching the skies and turn down my music so I can hear. If I hear or see anything that is out of the ordinary, I pull over and lay as low and as quiet as I can. I get scared even more when my radio goes to random static in places that normally doesn't have any problems. I start moving again when the static clears or the screeching sounds far enough. My boyfriend and I were on a hike in the mountains of Colorado and were unaware it was a secluded place until we got there. Our car was the only one parked at the trailhead and after three miles on the trail, one set of footprints appeared in the snow going the same direction as us. There were no footprints coming back out. We even yelled and clapped a bit to make sure whomever it was wasn't hurt or stuck but got no response. We were in the car on the back roads where I live, and it was nighttime. We were the only car around, no city lights. But as we are driving, I hear my mom say, Oh shit, I look up to see some type of creature that didn't move in a forward motion, but sideways, and it darted in cornfield. It had four legs. It almost looked like a man. But I don't want to call it that due to its rapid side movement. Think of a crab. I was out in the woods in Bedford, Pennsylvania the first day of deer season. Heard what sounded like something running around to my right. It really sounded like a dog running. I take out a flashlight and shine it where the noise is, and there's nothing in sight. I put the flashlight away, and around five minutes later I hear the noise again. I shine the light in again. Nothing there. I periodically heard the noise after that, but I didn't bother shining a light again. I figured it was a coyote, but still kind of creepy. Flynn and I were 13 years old and way back in the woods building deer stands before bow hunting season. A solid three miles from anything. We're heading home late as the sun is setting, carrying backpacks and tools, talking and laughing. We're walking along a fire road, and immediately to our right, about 20 yards away, someone shoots a shotgun directly over our heads. You could hear the shot hitting the trees on the opposite side of the road. We hit the deck with ears ringing and didn't move a muscle. The shots came from out of a large area of bramble and tall grass, so it was impossible to see anyone. We started whispering our plan to each other, which consisted of yelling, Hey, there's someone here! thinking maybe it was an idiot poacher, thinking we were deer. Believe it or not, it happens. A lot. 
Then the scariest part was there was zero response, no movement or anything. So plan B was to count to three and haul ass with backpacks, pulled up to try and protect the back of our heads. We were both fast on a normal day, but we were never faster than when we were running down that road. We decided not to tell our parents or the cops since we didn't technically have permission to uh, be on the land and bay to be building deer stands on it. Our theory is it was some crazy-ass poacher who didn't want two kids in his territory and thought scaring them would do the trick. He was right. Was on a solo hike or camp, popped my tent up around dusk in a hydro cut in a wood and settled in for the night. I have a tarp I use as a footprint for my tent just to smooth out the rocks or roots or whatever all else is on the ground. It's only slightly larger than my tent itself. Maybe an extra 16 feet on one side I use for a shoe mat. Anyway, bedding down and a few hours into sleep when I start hear a chorus of coyotes yipping from a little ways off. Over a course of 20 or so minutes, maybe a little shorter. The calls start getting louder, and I realize they're getting closer to me. Calls at this point are loud and numerous, so I, I figure there was a few of them around. At the point where it sounds like they can't get louder, they all simultaneously shut up. It's quiet for 15 or so seconds, felt about a year. And then I hear paw steps on my tarp directly outside my door, right next to my head. I'm usually a pretty calm guy and generally good with animals, but I totally filled my pants at that point. The coyotes sniffed a few times at my tannin and then walked off the tarp. They didn't make a peep after that. Next morning I packed up and was hiking down the hydro cut towards the initial yipping and saw a portion of thickety woods that had scratch marks on some of the trees, figured it was near their den. Whoops! I'd been told of a good fishing spot on the Roaring River by a friend. My buddy and I left a car at the Roaring River campground and drove up the little north fork, or skirting the ridge above the river. We drove to the end and walked a trail down to the river, about one-half miles. We figured we were six, seven miles from the campground. We got to the river at about 9 a.m. while walking down the river for about four or five hours fishing. My buddy and I came across a wide bend in the river, fairly deep, 15 feet or so. There was a mud trail coming out of the water, as if we had scared someone or thing. When we arrived at the site, there was a trail of wet sand footprints leaving the water and into heavy brush. We looked at the prints and were stunned at their length. They were a size 17, 18. Two of the prints were extremely clear. At the time, we thought we were close to the campground, so we didn't think much of it. We didn't reach the campground till nearly dark. A few months later, there was an article in the Oregonian by Phil Sanford, who wrote a column regularly about a sighting by two women from Oregon City at the Roaring River campground area. It's late at night at round 12, so close to an hour ago as of posting. I live in Arkansas and outside city limits, but not too far into the woods. I still have neighbors. I was playing on my phone when I heard the sound of a primate outside my house. From inside my room, years ago my dad had told me he heard something similar like he heard what sounded like an ape in the woods one day. I never believed him. I'm not sure what kinds of animals could make sounds similar to that type of animal. This is an account of what myself and a friend witnessed on May 15, 1997. We were sitting at the river's edge on the Molala River, near the logging bridge, which is near the train trestle in the old Malala Forest Road, there were a bunch of young people partying just before we got there and had left a big mess. Two nice people stayed behind. We chatted with them for a while and started hearing small noises in the woods about 50 yards behind us. 
The four of us figured it was the police checking things out, so it was about 9.30 p.m. this time, and the two people who stayed behind decided to leave because it was getting late. About one minute after they left, I was taking a leak over by the bridge and heard a large threshing sound going through the water. Needless to say, I did not stick around and know it was in no way a deer, elk, or bear, because I have been an avid hunter for years. My friend, however, is a little fearless at times, so he decided to go take a look, and this is what he saw. Following the sound going across the water, my eyes focused on an area about ten feet from the far bank of the river. The area was a swift, moving rapid that was about five feet deep. In the moonlight, I saw a figure crossing the river. As it lunged through the water that was only waist-deep on it, the figure was a person because of the immense size of it. It was about as wide as two good-sized men, and the five-foot-deep water only arose slightly over its waist. As it disappeared into the woods, we could hear the sound of large limbs being snapped like twigs. It was about then that we decided to leave the scene. I was nine and my brother was ten. My family was coming back from a cross-country trip. My dad was asleep and my mom was driving. My brother was asleep and I had just started to wake up. The sun had just came up and light was pouring through the valley. We came around a bend, slowing down a little, and I heard my mom curse. We thought it was a hitchhiker at first, crouched down by the side of the road. But as we got closer, it turned and looked at us, stood up, and with one stride disappeared into the forest. It was big, easy eight half to nine feet, covered in light brown hair. The eyes were so big and dark, I just cried. I was terrified. One speeding ticket later, we're home. We lived in Mill City at the time. As I was washing up in the runoff creek, I noticed my dog quickly became startled. I noticed my dog getting up and putting his nose into the wind. I saw him become scared as his hair is on his back raised. Instead of barking or growling, he quickly backtracked, never losing sight of what he was tracking. When I looked in the direction he was looking, I realized why he was scared. There was a large creature coming out of the woods about forty, fifty yards ahead, downstream and downwind from me. The creature leisurely walked out from the trees and stopped at the river bank. At first, I thought it was a person. Then I looked closer and noticed it was all in black, head to toe. I noticed its big arms covered in a thick black coat and its hands all black as well. By this time, my dog was looking extremely concerned. My dog was on edge and acting erratic. Then I caught a glimpse of the creature's profile and noticed his face was all black as well, with sharp features, strong cheekbones, and black lips. The creature never turned to look at me. I don't think it even noticed me or my dog. It never looked at us, I realized, because we were upwind from it. At that point, I wasn't sure what I was looking at, though I knew I had never seen anything like it before. I instinctively ducked below the river bank and calmly and slowly moved away upstream. I signaled my dog to follow, and he instinctively understood. When I was far enough away, I raised my head up to see if I could still see it. It wasn't where I last spotted it, and that alerted me to leave. I made my way back to camp only a hundred feet further from the stream, and I told my girlfriend what I saw. We both were became startled since we were deep in the woods, far from the main road. We immediately packed up our camp and left the site within ten minutes. I never thought that what I had seen was a Bigfoot. I didn't know what I had seen, actually. I couldn't explain it until we drove into Portland the next night. That night we ate at a local diner, and I picked up the local paper. One of the main stories was in regards to Bigfoot sightings. I read it thinking the topic was of interest and realized many people had sighted Bigfoot around the area where I saw the creature. Also, all the sightings were of an all-black creature. This really caught my attention because all my life I thought Bigfoot was brown. That is when I first realized that what I had seen might have been a Bigfoot sighting.
I grew up around the country. I, I grew up looking for Bigfoot. My grandmother had about 100 acres or so out between Jasper, Oregon, and Lowell. She had cattle, and we were driving out to look after them most every day, not just on the weekend. And I always had an eye open for something, but never once did I ever see or hear, hear anything. And then I see something along I-5 on a rainy night, and it saw me. It knew I was staring at it. The hair on it wasn't pretty kind of uneve. All these years later, I'm still a little in disbelief, but it sat like an ape with long arms and legs. And it stood up, and there was no mistaking that this thing was exceedingly tall. I don't know what else I can offer. My apologies for reporting something that happened in 1997. It's funny, like I said, I grew up looking for Bigfoot or Sasquatch, more or less because of where I lived, and then I see it, or whatever I saw, and I almost wish I hadn't. Kind of shook me up. Still does a little. My friends and I were way into Frisbee golf for a while. So after we graduated high school, we decided to go camping down in Moab, Utah. We were lucky enough to find a really cool course a bit away from Moab. When we got there, an old man said we needed to pay $10 a night. We did. Then we slept in our tent inside a yurk. That night we went to sleep with our backpacks in the tent. The morning we woke up and saw all our backpacks were outside the tent in the yurk's doorway. In my friend's camera, there were pictures on his camera that showed all of us sleeping. I don't know how the old man could have done that without waking us up. I have never, ever been able to sleep in a private campsite since. Backpacking alone in the woods of Missouri, I was woken in the middle of the night by a blood-curdling scream in the dark. This was miles and miles from any town or houses. I thought it must have been a bird or something and settled back down to sleep. Before I could drift off again, I heard another scream, only this time closer. Definitely not a bird, not a bug or anything I could think of that would habitat those woods. It repeated again and again, coming ever closer until it sounded like it was right outside of my tent. I was too terrified to look outside, too terrified to move. All of a sudden it stopped. I spent the rest of the night terrified and alone, completely bewildered by the screams. Once I got back to civilization, I found out it had been a red fox making the cries in the night. They make a crazy howl scream that sounds totally unreal. I had never heard the noise they make, so you can imagine how scared it made me that night. It was elk season 2020, 1 October, about 6 p.m., and on the upper Abiqua, Ori and two others were driving slowly along the north-south road, Ori in the passenger seat when he saw a 12-15 foot creature walking, swinging its arms, crouched, walking in the same direction they were driving. It all of a sudden shot straight out very rapidly and was gone. It was black, very broad and very stout, like a big tree. Asked how he knew the size, and Ari said he was a carpenter and a good judge of height. Later, Ori took some very good tape recordings of the creatures. A barking, drawn-out howl similar to many other tapes I've heard, only a much better quality and no barking dogs. I am a police officer in a large city. There are housing projects in my sector that house low-income residents and also some suffering from mental health issues. There's an elderly Haitian woman who calls late at night and swears she can hear ghosts and voodoo spirits in her residence. The first time I showed up with my partner, I told her I would go in and speak with the ghosts and close the bedroom for about five minutes, then opened it, and she hesitantly entered with me. I told her I asked them to leave and they need her permission to come back. She celebrated and said she can no longer see them and thanked us. This woman is otherwise quite articulate and intelligent and always refuses medical help. She will call 911 periodically every three, 
four months for similar reasons. And I'll go in with a water bottle with no label and go in and have her point the location where she saw them. And I sprinkle some holy water in the area and she thanks us and offers us food. We always politely decline and exit the residence. I was a caregiver in a retirement home for six months at the beginning of the pandemic. We had one patient, let's call them Robert, that was mute so when they called us because they needed something. Of course we would just hang up and go to their rooms. I had been on vacation for a week and my co-workers and I didn't have the chance to go over what had happened while I was away. We had 24 patients for two caregiver, so we would split the unit in half. 12 residents for each caregiver, and we would help the other if needed. So, the first shift after my vacation, I was taking care of Robert's unit. A few minutes after I arrived, I got a call from Robert's room. So I hang up, finish with my current patient, and call me walk to the room. When I arrived, the door was locked, which was really unusual, since Robert usually leaves the door open. I knock, unlock the door, and open it. To my surprise... The room was pitch black except the television that was turned on. It took me a few minutes to realize that Roberts wasn't in the room. So I called my co-worker and asked, Have you seen Roberts? And that's when they told me, Oh, yeah. Hmm. He passed away two days ago. All right, weird, but not the first time that our system glitches like that and we get a phone call and empty room. I go on with my shift like nothing happened. I had left the door open. When I was helping another patient walk to the kitchen, when we passed Robert's room, they said, Hi, Robert. I thought you were at the hospital. Welcome back. I was 100% convinced that the room was haunted now. We would get a call from that room a few times a week until Robert's was buried, and after that, nothing else happened in that room. We've also had another patient calling us because there was Mike sitting in his chair every night. Mike was the name of the patient that passed away in that room. They had never met. My brother and I have this campsite about two hours' drive out of the eastern side of Melbourne, Australia. A quick run on a Friday night after work to a really, really secluded spot up a logging trail off the main road. The road is good enough for a standard car to handle, and on many occasions, a whole convoy of us would make the trip up for the weekend. This is a really quiet spot, and it would be extremely rare to even have another car come up the road. Other people would use the same spot from time to time, however. You would see the remains of old campfires and occasionally rubbish left behind. But then one time we found a couple of graves, new ones. Two pots side by side, maybe ten meters away from what you would call the main thoroughfare, about seven foot by three feet wide. All the sod had been carefully picked up and then put back in over the top, but there was no mistaking what they looked like, so we started digging with the small camp spade we had. The ground had most definitely been dug up. We dug down maybe two feet on one hole and gave up, I guess. Made a stop by the police station in town on the way home. They went digging, but I don't know if they found anything. They left mounds of dirt up there, so they went looking. Perfect spot to make someone disappear up there. If you wander 50 yards out of the main camp, you're in some thick, thick bush. Only way to move around is to follow a wombat trail. First off, I've lived and hunted and hiked in these woods most of my life. Born and raised here by folks that trace our line back to the Meeks Party Blue Bucket Wagon Train. So I have studied plenty of animals that have lived here. What I heard on that late fall evening made the hair stand straight up. The month was September, the weather was warm. My husband had returned to Redmond to go bowling on his league. I stayed behind as some friends were to come up later that evening and join us. The state was doing a lot of road work and were blasting parts along the highway to clear space for wider roads. I was putting more wood on the fire when I looked at my watch. Our friends were late as usual. It was 10.30 a Friday. You could heard the trucks and the blasting going on along the road. 
Then there was this real loud blast. It shook the ground under the stump I was sitting on. Further away from the road, you could hear a rock slide started from the blast. Then the woods came to life. I could hear running of a very large animal going through everything in his way. Underbrush was snapping, and small trees could be heard crashing to the ground. As the rocks in the canyon stopped sliding, the woods became quiet again. Then, just across the lake from where my tent was pitched, the hoeing and screaming started. These sounds went on for at least half hour. I, being alone at this time, became rather unnerved and decided that my tent would be a better place to wait for my friends from. I crawled inside and found my rifle load a shell into the barrel and sat there in the dark. The sounds across the lake had all but vanished. I could still hear something moving over there, and it wasn't deer, elk, bear, cougars, cattle, people, lynx, badgers, wild dogs, or wolverines. At 11.30 p.m., my friends finally made up to the camp. They could tell that something had made a very bad impression on me and asked what had happened. I told them. We waited till my mate got back from town, but no more noise was heard that night. As this is about more than just what I saw, it would be nice for it to be keep unlisted. Thank you. This story is of mine. It's actually my dad's. Every other summer, him and a few of his friends go over to Maine and do some bass fishing. The encounter happened at around two to three in the morning. My dad got out of his tent because he had to take a piss. As he was draining himself, he heard a snap about 25 feet away. He looked up and saw nothing. To make sure it wasn't a predator, he shone his flashlight over in the general direction. The woods were really thick, so he really didn't see much at all, except for a pair of eyes. He really couldn't tell how high up off the ground they were, so being the person he is, he walked towards it. As he did so, whatever the thing was ran away, and my dad got a better look at it. He says that it was around eight feet and smelt pretty bad, like trash. He told his friends the next day, but they decided to stay the rest of the week due to the fact that my dad didn't feel that the Bigfoot wanted to hurt them, but was just more curious. He came home and told me, and now a few years later I'm telling you, I really hope that one day I could see what he saw so I can fully believe that this world is actually a strange one. I've had a lot of paranormal encounters, but this is not my story. This is my mother's. My mom and my uncle had to go pick up my grandmother. She worked in a small town called the Red River, and the blizzard was so bad that my grandmother's car wasn't turning on. So she told my mom to pick her up and be safe because the roads were very slippery. My mom told my uncle to go with her, and they were at a cuesta in New Mexico, and they drove slowly because the storm was so bad. While driving, a large creature started walking across the road. It was about nine feet tall, and the creature had white fur and large teeth, and it just stared at my mother and uncle, and then it turned away and ran to the woods. They started talking about it, and they both agreed that it was a Bigfoot. The next day, my uncle went to the area. He found footprints and even took a picture of it. In the mountains of New Mexico, creepy stuff happens every day. I've got lots of stories. Large parts of my childhood were spent on a reservation, and I swear every house there has something spooky in it. I will just quickly tell a few notable ones. When I was about eight years old, my cousin and I were playing hide-and-seek while the adults were gone. I walked through the kitchen and right by a bunch of food on the table. I've never been very observant and completely didn't realize that he was hiding in the fridge. I walked to the hallway and as I'm gazing down, I can see a little bit through the doorways. A small black figure went running across one of the rooms at the end and dives under their bunk bed. I thought I caught my cousin, so I ran into the room to check under the bed, but nothing was there. A lot of people had seen this figure in their house. Apparently, their uncle had turned a corner and bumped right into it and that it was solid, but he couldn't see through it. Just darkness. Different story. I was left alone at 16 in my mother's house when I started to hear a baby cry in the wall. 
At first I brushed it off. Gotta just be the neighbors in the other apartment. That's when I realized my mom no longer lived in a fourplex and that our nearest neighbors were too far to hear. I told her about it and she had heard it too. We later found out that a traditional funeral for a baby had been held in the house. So we smudged it and left a plate of food outside. This probably isn't going to be the most spooky story, just something happened to me recently that's kept me paranoid. My parents got ready for bed, and I was staying up late on my computer as always. We said our good nights, and they went upstairs. Not too soon after, I heard a sound from the dining room window. It was as if someone took their hand and went down the entire length of the window with purpose and pressure, like nails on a chalkboard and the window is too high up for any of the animals in the forest outside our house to do it. Nor do any animals of that size even come close to the house. I don't think any human could possibly be that tall to be able to do it either. My dad can't even reach the top of the window, and he's around six feet. I paused everything and tried to listen to see if I could hear anything else. Footsteps, breathing, etc., because I was too scared to go into the dining room to investigate. I wouldn't be able to see anything in that darkness anyways, but I heard nothing, just the hand down the window. It was petrifying, and I still have no idea what happened. It's been a few days since then, but no sound has happened since. I worry one day I will stare through a window and see something staring back at me and promptly have a heart attack. Yeah. I do believe this isn't a natural thing, as it was a very odd sound, like it was a bigger-than-usual hand rubbing my window. I don't see any other plausible explanation for it other than the paranormal. It was a night I'll never forget. About ten years ago, my friends and I were driving in Jackson, New Jersey, headed to Sonic or someplace similar for a late-night snack. We were all laughing and joking, enjoying the freedom of our youth and the open road ahead of us. As we continued down the highway, the atmosphere suddenly shifted. The night air grew thick with fog, swallowing the landscape and reducing our visibility to almost nothing. We slowed down, trying to navigate through the dense mist. Out of nowhere, a tall, ragged-looking man appeared in the road, only five feet in front of our car. It was as if he had materialized from the fog itself. My friends and I all saw him, and we screamed in terror, fearing the inevitable impact. Our driver slammed on the brakes, but we knew it was too late to avoid hitting the mysterious figure. We braced for the collision, but the impact never came. Our car continued to glide forward, and the man seemed to vanish as suddenly as he had appeared. Confused and frightened, I quickly turned around to see what had happened to him. But the fog had disappeared completely, leaving no trace of the eerie figure we had just encountered. We drove to Sonic in stunned silence, each of us trying to process what had just happened. We couldn't find a rational explanation for the sudden fog, the ragged man, or his disappearance. To this day, we still talk about that night, wondering if we had somehow crossed paths with a ghost or a supernatural being. Despite the passing of time, the memory of that night remains vivid and chilling. The experience taught us that there are things in this world that defy explanation, and sometimes those mysteries reveal themselves when we least expect it. When I was around five years old, I started praying to Satan alongside my regular prayers, believing that he was protecting and loving me. My family was very religious, and we attended church frequently, so I prayed often. Over time, Satan started to communicate with me, although it's possible that it was just my overactive imagination as a child. I remember these experiences vividly, including dreams where I talked to Satan. One dream in particular stands out in my memory. In a dream, I found myself in a grassy field with a man who had no discernible features, but seemed normal in appearance. We talked about my future, but in the clouds he pointed out a hand reaching down. A powerful voice boomed, asking me to take the hand and renounce evil to come into the light. 
I felt compelled to take the hand, and I woke up feeling scared and hid under my sheets. After a while, something gently poked my solar plexus as I'm writing this. I still get goosebumps because this had me scared shitless the entire night. Sorry for the sudden change in tone, LOL. The following night, I had a sleepover with my sisters in the basement, and we prayed together before bed. After finishing my regular prayers, I started to pray to Satan again. But my sisters heard me and yelled at me, explaining why I should never pray to him, and that I needed to repent. Later on in life, after I had stopped, I had my first confession, and I confessed my experiences with Satan along with other things to the priest. I wish there was more to this story, but there really isn't. I'm not sure if this was just a kid's overactive imagination, or if I really spoke to the devil. I have similar stories I can share, but they require a lot more context, and I don't really feel like writing them out just to have people not believe me. Share your opinion on this, or similar experiences you might have. Use chat gap to revise this, so if some parts sound weird, that's why. I'll try to make it short, but when I was younger, I was in bed with my mother, and we were just jokingly trying to scare each other by telling different scenarios. Suddenly, we both heard loud stomps right above us on the roof, and we literally both froze in fear. It quite frankly sounded like a large man walking in circles on our roof with heavy combat boots. The thing is, we were in a very secluded native reservation, and the closest people to our house lived about six kilometers away. Also, mind you, it was wintertime, so I seriously doubt anyone would come to our house just to walk on our roof in 17 weather at 11.30 p.m. at night. My mother could tell that I was very frightened by what we were hearing, and so she made up an excuse for the noise, saying, Oh, it's probably some dog. Tail hitting the walls of our house. But it was definitely not that at all. She even later told me that she only said that to help calm me down. This walking noise continued for about ten minutes, and it abruptly stopped and didn't continue on after that. We did make sure to lock all doors and windows that night, but we both definitely knew it wasn't a physical intruder that was making those noises, but still better safe than sorry. In the end, we both don't know what the hell was walking on our roof that night. Like I said, it was also winter, and so the next morning my mother went out to check for any tracks, and there were simply none to be seen. Even on the roof I have a lot more similar experiences like this, but none have stopped my heart like that night did. We also live in Ontario, so I frankly believe. Nothing here can make the heavy stomps we heard, let alone even get on the roof. As a park ranger, you become immune to many weird things. Strange figures in the woods, unnatural-looking animals, or even the downright paranormal. After a point, you kind of just live with it. The rule is, if you don't interfere in matters that don't concern you, you'll be safer for the most part. I hope the rule works, because sometimes situations get far too real and scary. They get far, far too real. Granted, not every ranger experiences the paranormal. While most of us lead somewhat adventurous lives, some more than others, there's also a category of rangers who wouldn't consider their job anything but mundane. To this day, I belong in the middle of this spectrum, but something happened last week, and while I would have liked to ignore it, as I usually do, I don't think I can. My partner, whom we'll call Carlos, had patrol duty for the night. We have both been relocated and recently moved into this cabin somewhere in the corner of the park where several other rangers have stayed in the past. It's a decent little space, two adjoining rooms and a tiny little bath. Not very spacious, but who am I to demand? Luxury in the middle of nowhere and at a job like this anyway. Around 7 p.m. we had some tea, read some news, and put on our gear leaving the cabin. There aren't many other rangers stationed nearby at the moment, so we had a lot of ground to cover. I didn't mind. I liked walking in the dark. Sure, 
It had been scary for my initial years as a ranger, but over time I found it to be very peaceful. This is weird, I know, but the peace for me is very real. We walked for an hour straight in silence before finally getting bored and making some small talk. Carlos started by cracking some pathetically lame jokes, which somehow transitioned into horror stories. He belonged to an orthodox home and strongly believed in the paranormal. For a guy from New Jersey, he definitely has some good scares up his sleeve. Around what I guess was two or three in the morning, we sat down on a tree that had fallen nearby. I took out some Jews I'd brought with me and handed him one. They had felt unnaturally cold for the weather then, and there was actual condensation on the outside. In hindsight, that should have been a major flag. As we drank, Carlos shared more stories. He was telling me about some flying vinegar, dipped vampire from the Philippines, when I heard a groan. My instinct told me it was an injured creature, but it didn't feel like the groan of an animal. It felt human, like that of an older woman grunting in pain. It was very distinct. Carlos and I jumped up from the log at the same time. He had heard it, too. I nodded at him, and he pointed his flashlight in the direction of the sound. It came again albeit a little more distant this time. I called out, but there was no response. With my right hand on my firearm and my flashlight in the left, I followed the direction of the voice, calling out repeatedly. The groan came yet again, and we increased our pace. I was in front while Carlos quickly trailed behind, calling out a series of hellos and is anybody there, like a broken record. After a minute or so of walking, we discovered the source of the voice. In front of us was a short, pale old woman in a black cape facing towards us, but looking straight down and mumbling something. She was bald, and her cape was very baggy and tattered. I instantly sensed something unnatural. It creeped the heck out of me. However, in the off chance that this was a human, we were obligated to help her. Carlos approached the woman, asking if she was hurt. When she looked up, her face was wrong. In the dim light, I could see the manifestation of the unnaturalness I'd felt a second ago. Her eyes were pitch black as if nothing was there, and she looked at Carlos with those alien eyes. Even her skin was dead, looking a dark blue. He froze in his tracks. Her mouth was basically a huge gash in her face that went ear to ear. This lady, or whatever this thing was, put on her hood and shifted her gaze towards me speaking something telepathically before just vanishing in the middle of nowhere, almost like she disintegrated. I staggered, fell backward, unsure of what to even think. Her movements were even unnatural and inhuman, just like her appearance. I don't know how to describe it, but was this an alien or a demon? I looked over at Carlos, his face whiter than it had ever been, and he knelt down, saying an audible prayer. It was only after a while that I found the strength to get up, my legs still shaking violently, but they still worked. They felt extremely cold and empty, but somehow I found the strength and helped Carlos up. We made our way straight back to the cabin, following the markers on the trees. I poured some hot tea while he sat at the table with his head in his hands. Now it was about 5 a.m., and God knows how much time we had spent sitting there on the ground, too weak to get up. I tried discussing what we had seen, but he wouldn't respond, so I left it alone. Around 9 a.m., I called my superior, told him what had happened. He told me to get back to the job, asked me if we had been drinking while at work. They weren't much help, so I hung up on him. We had somehow, again, almost broken the rule and interfered. As long as we didn't do it again, we would be safe. The incident was very traumatizing. No sane person would believe me when I say we went back to the forest every night after and still do. The rule is supposed to protect us, and we had faith in it. At least I hope it does. This job has meant everything to me, and I don't have a plan B. So, I'm hoping I don't encounter this stuff anymore. I tried to look around and see if there's anything I could use as a reference before posting this so when you read it, you would understand. It kind of reminded me of the witch I think they call La Llorona, if I'm remembering correctly. But whatever this was, it was either a demon or a supernatural entity. It felt evil, 
It looked evil. Why it was there, I don't know, and I don't care. I just don't want to see it again. My name is Aaron, and I'm a police officer who often works with park rangers to maintain the safety and beauty of our local parks. One summer, I was partnered with Carl, a ranger from the Sierra Club, and we were assigned to clear barbed wire at Squaw Meadows, south of Squaw Mountain in Oregon. We camped overnight on July 15th, eager to begin our work the next day. As night fell, the forest around us came alive with the sounds of nocturnal creatures. I'd always been intrigued by the local legends of the Wendigo, a mysterious and fearsome creature said to inhabit these woods. As we sat around the campfire, I decided to try tapping on a piece of wood, hoping to communicate with the elusive creature. To my surprise, I heard a reply, a very loud rap coming from the roaring river valley below our campsite. Carl and I exchanged glances, our interest peaked. The next day, we continued our work, clearing the barbed wire that marred the pristine landscape. Our peaceful work was suddenly interrupted by the roar of a herd of motorcycles. The riders sped by at a higher elevation, their engines echoing through the valley. As the noise from the motorcycles faded, a strange sound reached my ears. It was a loud, monkey-like whoop that seemed to come from the same direction as the Wendigo's rap the night before. Carl looked at me, his eyes wide with astonishment. Did you hear that? he asked, his voice barely above a whisper. Yeah, I did, I replied, my heart pounding in my chest. It sounded like it came from the valley. We decided to investigate, cautiously making our way down to the roaring river valley. As we ventured deeper into the woods, the whooping sound grew louder, but we could not pinpoint its source. The forest seemed to close in around us as if it were hiding a secret that it did not want to share. Despite our efforts, we never found the source of the strange sound. We continued our work clearing the barbed wire and ensuring the safety of the park for its visitors. Yet the memory of the Wendigo's reply and the eerie whooping sound stayed with me, a haunting reminder of the mysteries that still lurk in the depths of the forest. Though I may never know for certain whether I truly heard the Wendigo or not, the experience taught me to respect and appreciate the unknown. The wilderness holds secrets that may never be revealed, and I am grateful for the opportunity to experience its mysteries firsthand. My name is Sin Care, and I have always been drawn to the mysteries of the night. On July 12th, I found myself near the Willamette River. Town of Willamette, Oregon, at midnight. My trusty dog, Max, was with me, and we were exploring an area off the freeway where a sewage stream flowed through the brambles and swamp. The arc street lights cast eerie shadows on the ground as we wandered through the darkness. As we walked along the stream, I suddenly noticed a large white creature moving around. It was about 100, 200 feet away, bobbing up and down in different locations. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was watching me, studying my every move. It seemed to be about seven feet tall, with three-inch long, white, dirty hair and a head shaped like a massive dome. My heart pounded in my chest as I realized that this might be the dogman, a creature that had been reported in the area before. There were a lot of nitria living in the area and I wondered if the dogman was attracted to their presence. Strangely, Max didn't seem concerned about the creature at all. He just sniffed the air, seemingly unbothered by the eerie presence. I decided to cautiously approach the creature, hoping to get a better look and perhaps even capture some evidence of its existence. As I moved closer, the dogman continued to bob and weave through the shadows, never staying in one place for long. It seemed almost curious, as if it was trying to get a better look at me without revealing itself completely. I remembered hearing about white werewolf tracks that had been reported upstream on a tributary of the Tualatin River last year. Could this creature be related to those sightings? My curiosity and fascination only grew as I continued to observe the dogman. Unfortunately, as I tried to get closer, the creature seemed to sense my intentions and suddenly vanished into the darkness. I searched the area for any signs of its presence, 
hoping to find tracks or some other evidence that would prove what I had seen. But there was nothing. No tracks, no disturbed foliage, nothing. Feeling both exhilarated and disappointed, I returned to Max, who was still sniffing the air, seemingly unfazed by the entire encounter. I couldn't help but wonder why he hadn't reacted more strongly to the dogman's presence. Did he sense something about the creature that I couldn't? That night, I returned home with more questions and answers. My encounter with the dogman near the Willamette River was a strange and unsettling experience, but it only fueled my desire to uncover the truth about the mysterious creatures that lurk in the shadows of our world. Growing up, I had always been a curious and imaginative child. I was about six or seven years old at the time, and like most kids, I would occasionally wake up in the middle of the night feeling scared or uneasy. This particular night was no different. I found myself wide awake, the darkness of my room feeling heavier than usual. Seeking comfort, I decided to head to my parents' room. Their door was shut, and for reasons I couldn't explain, I didn't dare open it. Instead, I sat down in the hallway on my beloved Garfield pillow, feeling a strange sense of unease in the dimly lit corridor. As I sat there trying to make sense of my sudden fear, I saw something that sent chills down my spine. A figure emerged from the darkness walking into the middle of the hallway. It was black darker than anything I had ever seen, as if it were made of an impossibly deep abyss. The figure was mostly humanoid, but its head was elongated, resembling the bird-like plague masks from centuries past. Frozen in terror, I watched as the figure stopped in the middle of the hall, and then, to my utter horror, turned to look directly at me. Its eyes were large, a haunting greenish-yellow color that seemed to pierce my very soul. The world around us seemed to stand still the air thick with an almost tangible sense of dread, and then just as suddenly as it had appeared, the figure was gone. The darkness of the hallway swallowed it whole, leaving me alone and trembling with fear. I bolted back to my bed and hid under the covers, hoping that whatever that thing was, it wouldn't return. To this day, I can still vividly recall the chilling encounter, the image of those haunting eyes forever etched in my memory. I don't know what it was that I saw that night, but it remains one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Not me, but my father experienced it. It was last summer in the evening, and we last pretty secluded. He came back later that evening and told me that he saw S-5-6 light balls flying in formation near his location, away from him. While doing so, they changed their formation regularly, and even though he couldn't estimate how fast they really were, at least from his view, they started out slow and accelerated a lot till he lost sight. He asked me if this could have been some natural occurrence, because he said he never saw something like that before. My X-Files trained brain screamed UFOs after I told my father that, with a smirk grin in my face, he made me promise not to tell anybody about this, to prevent his buddies making fun of him. Man, I'm so jealous that he got to see it and not me. My husband has always been an avid outdoorsman and loves to swap stories with his friends about their adventures in the wild. I remember one evening when we were sitting by the fire and he shared a chilling tale that had been passed down to him by a close friend. As a pregnant woman with a foggy memory, I'll try my best to recount the story as it was told to me. His friend, let's call him Mark, had been an experienced hunter and was no stranger to spending nights alone in the wilderness. One autumn day, he ventured deep into the woods, hoping to bag a deer from his tree stand, a hideout spot nestled high up in the branches. As the sun began to set, Mark settled into his tree stand, waiting patiently for his prey. But as night fell, an eerie stillness settled over the forest, broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves. It wasn't long before Mark realized that he wasn't alone. From the darkness, he could hear strange noises, unlike anything he had ever encountered in his years of hunting. 
The sounds were guttural and menacing, sending a shiver down his spine, paralyzed with fear. Mark could only sit there, praying that whatever was stalking him would lose interest and move on. But the creature, whatever it was, didn't leave. Instead, it stayed throughout the entire night, its chilling presence a constant source of terror for Mark. The once brave hunter was reduced to a quivering mess, his mind racing with thoughts of what might happen if the creature decided to strike. Finally, morning arrived, and with it, a renewed sense of courage. Seizing the opportunity, Mark climbed down from his tree stand and sprinted back to his car, not daring to look back. He never did find out what had stalked him that night, but the experience left a lasting impression on him. As my husband finished recounting the story, I couldn't help but feel a chill run down my spine. I knew that the woods held many mysteries and unknown dangers, but this tale was a stark reminder that sometimes the most terrifying encounters are those that we cannot explain. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.